I'm Brian Westbrook with GeekWire Studios, joined now by BMC's Chief Technology Officer, Ram Chakravarte. Welcome, thank you for being here. First of all, tell us tell us about BMC. What is it you're trying to solve here? Uh, Brian, good to be here, thank you. Um, BMC is a company that has been around for uh, multiple decades, and we are known to for our credibility, scale, and resilience. And that's withstood the test of time across decades. We had our genesis as a mainframe company, and now have broadened our uh, portfolio to automation and a whole host of other areas. And our calling card to fame has, in addition to this trust and credibility, been successfully evolving across every tech paradigm. We are uh, roughly uh, 4,000 employees headquartered in Houston, but we operate across the globe. And many of the largest, most complex global multinational companies are customers of ours. And you talked about a lot of the new technologies. We'd be remiss if we didn't talk about AI. How do you get the most out of your data using AI? Okay, how do I get the most out of data? You said you were gonna keep it tough. All right, that's a good, good starter. All right. So, AI and data are in what I call a cosmic dance, where they are intricately intertwined and one without the other just does not make any sense. There are certain challenges with <clears throat> data when it comes to AI use cases. I'll outline three of them. One is basically the data quality that goes into training models. The second, and I'd, I'd include things like data drift out there. The second is data availability, which is ensuring you have the right set of data without violating your data privacy considerations. The third is basically the implications of Gen AI and the limitations slash current challenges in following regulations such as GDPR, which are data centric. So let's maybe tackle about how you get the most out of these investments by answering each of these data conundrums. When it comes to ensuring data quality with your AI investments, you need to think about end-to-end -end management of data pipelines. And that includes data orchestration, data observability, and data remediation, again, with an end-to-end view. That's bucket one. When it comes to data availability, one of the things that's becoming more and more prominent is what we call synthetic data generation to complement and overcome your challenges with your uh, privacy considerations. And when it comes to regulations, we are still at a nascent stage. There are some tools that are available that help you track, monitor, and ensure that there is discipline in rolling out your AI uh, initiatives, but there's a long way to go. What I would institute is, a, what I would suggest is instituting a set of robust AI development practices and imposing guardrails that can constrain your AI going willy-nilly and safeguarding your data. And there. certainly start there and then build from there, release or relax the guardrails as time and data availability and, and reliability improves. Let's talk about BMC for a second. Tell us about some of the latest innovations coming out of BMC. Sure. Decades of innovation, what's new? Okay, I'll give you the uh, ones that have just come out as well as give you a bird's eye view into something that we're working towards, right? We are at uh, the Airflow Summit, which is all about data and data orchestration. Our flagship product is Control M, which is a uh, which is enterprise scale resilient uh, workload and data pipeline orchestration solution. In a quest to answer some of the challenges in the data plane, we've just brought to market a new offering called Data Assurance. Mm -hmm. And that's about monitoring the health and performance of data as it traverses through pipelines, so that's one. And then we also have a really rich portfolio of what we call the modern mainframe uh, set of products. And then we recently released what we call uh, code generation assistance targeted at mainframe developers, as well as a whole bunch of other insights and our any platform, which is for automated mainframe intelligence. Lastly, to further our agenda in the automation space, we've brought to market and are enhancing an automation advisor that's a Gen AI based solution. That's current. Forward looking, a lot of our aspirations, I'll put them in three buckets. One, agentic AI based orchestration of workloads and data pipelines. That's something that we're working towards innovating. The second is about metadata management using agentic AI. And the third is comprehensive observability across heterogeneous orchestrators. Let's talk about tech leaders. Mm -hmm. What are three things they can do to build that innovation and to expand upon what they're doing now. Be afraid, be very afraid. Okay, not, all right. Just kidding. <laughs> okay, so in no particular order, the three things would be, number one, you want to engender a culture where 
failure is not frowned upon. So one of the things that we've done in BMC over the last uh, five, six years is this notion of fast-paced experiments, failing just as fast if it doesn't pan out, learning and then building and scaling out the products. So we've been reasonably successful with that. But coupled with that is another thing, which is ensuring that the person that is experimenting and building something out, they are empowered. So one of the things that we did was, we said, if you've got an idea, you can basically work on that idea if it passes muster through a review community, uh, group. And if it passes muster, you are given 12 months to work on that idea with the guarantee that if it doesn't pan out, you go back to your old job, no questions asked. So that encourages people to go take risks that they otherwise wouldn't. The third ingredient is overall organizational culture change, which is we would launch these company-wide uh, ideation campaigns, if I may, that would get at the heart of, hey, no idea is a stupid idea, so submit your ideas. It may not necessarily get selected, but you're stimulating your thought process and going outside of your daily job, and that has a, an overall effect on changing the culture and orienting it towards an innovation culture, if I may. So fail forward, allow for risks, yeah. allow experimentation, and certainly let the culture drive innovation. Absolutely. Excellent. Let's talk about why enterprises should really focus on hybrid interoperability. Okay, that's a great term. So it's probably going to be a structured response, fair warning in advance. If you look at any organization, in, uh, in terms of the buckets for its strategic business orchestration needs. It falls under two buckets. One is orchestrating systems of record or what we call business applications. Yep. The second is orchestrating systems of insights and decisions, which are otherwise known as your data pipelines. They are the it would be nirvana for organizations if the two operated independent of one another, but that's not the case. So I'll explain this, why hybrid interoperability is important with a simple example. Take customer churn uh, analysis and prediction. It's a data analytics use case, which basically tells you which customers are at risk of attriting. But it requires data from your system of records to basically tell you, um, get the customer information from your ERP systems, uh, your uh, CRM, a whole bunch of contact center and other systems. So data flows from there to, uh, from the system of record to systems of insights and decisions. But at the end of the churn prediction uh, algorithm, when you've got your list of customers, that information has to flow back to your system of record to launch, launch targeted promotional campaigns that reduces the risk of attrition. That requires that seamless interoperability between the two systems, which is what we call hybrid interoperability. Thus hybrid. Exactly. And if you cannot solve for that, you're leaving a lot of value behind, and you're not necessarily ensuring that you are optimizing what your customers are looking for. So simple algorithm to illustrate a case in point, extrapolate that across a whole slew of uh, what you call use cases that are at the heart of how enterprises operate and that exponentially increases the importance of hybrid interoperability. So rather than the line of data, think of it as a cycle of data feeding yes. back into your line of business applications. Absolutely. I want to ask you, Ram, what's next? What's in the future, either for BMC or in the industry as a whole? Um, uh, the obvious thing is uh, the AI onslaught in a nice way. But what does that mean, right? Um, there's a lot of hype, and much of it is deserved. But making it real and getting value for organizations uh, is really about trying to make the transition from what we call deterministic systems to probabilistic systems. That calls for a whole host of changes to the operating model, every facet of their operating model. And that's going to be big people are not necessarily realizing the magnitude of change, for the industry at large, that's huge. For us personally, I'll uh, talk about it. We've talked about Control M, known for legendary resilience, high availability, high scale across enterprises. Yes, we can talk about agentic orchestration as the next evolution of Control M, but our customers think of us as credible, trustworthy, and resilient. If we make the switch from deterministic to probabilistic, we need to ensure that the same kind of trust and resilience can be provided in our product. That's going to be a big part of how we tackle this problem. Right. Ram, I want to say thank you for the time. It's been Brian, amazing it's chatting with Ram Chakravarte, CTO of BMC. I'm Brian Westbrook at the Geekwire Studios. Thanks for watching.